you got a lot of heat for being the most famous camper, you know, in, in the world, basically. <laughs> but were you expecting the some of the hate that you got for playing for the win? I said I understood that it was uh, that it was COD. Yeah, you know, just see a red dot, chase red dot. And what does it take to do streams that are that long? Are you taking any enhancers to, to, to go for 30 hours plus? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we can we can get into this if you want. Good morning, everybody. I'm happy to introduce another amazing streamer into the Mimosa Brunch. He's one of the godfathers of Warzone, one of the original leaderboard grinders, where she held the top spot for basically all of her dance. Nearly 550,000 followers on Twitch, a wall spanker, an absolute stud, it's Iron. Welcome in, Iron, how are we doing? Pretty good, yourself? I'm doing good, I'm doing good. So you're a Michigan man, born and raised. Let's start there. Go Blue. <laughs> Go Blue. Uh, how was your uh, childhood growing up in Michigan? I, mean, I thought I had a good childhood, honestly. I um, had both my parents in the home, huge. You know, Both of my parents loved me, they showed me quite a bit of love. I went to uh, a private school for the majority of my childhood, had good friends, um, wasn't bullied, so I really don't have any complaints about my childhood. <laughs> uh, besides being a, a late growth spurt, that'd be the one thing. I was always the smallest kid in um, elementary school, didn't hit my... Well, I said that I'm super tall anyway, but <laughs> to get to 5'10 took me till high school. And when you were growing up, did you have video games in the house all the time? Or what was your first introduction to video games? No, actually, I grew up in the middle of nowhere. Nowhere, nowhere. Like dial-up was the only thing that we could get. So I would have to go to friends' houses. And I was obsessed with going to friends' houses to play uh, shoot. Well, the first ever introduction to video games would have been... Pokemon on the Game Boy. Sure, Obsessed. yeah. If anyone hangs out in stream, I make Pokemon references all the time. <laughs> um, but Xbox, I think it was Star Wars Battlefront was the like OG shooter that I played. And that was just PvE. But I would go over to my buddy's house and just like grind that. I didn't want to go outside or do anything else. And the uh, very first FPS online that I played was Halo 2. And it was mm. over after that. I did get a, um, a GameCube growing up which was probably the best console to get with no internet. Yeah. Because uh, we just play like Super Smash Bros, basically. Mm -hmm. um, what else? There's like some Lord of the Rings games. My little brother uh, would delete every single one of my games. Every single <laughs> one. He'd just go in, create new, save over. So I'd beat all those games that I had a million times. Uh, sports games. I managed rosters in Madden more than I actually played the game. Yeah. I just loved it. But uh, yeah, so first introduction was Halo 2. That's kind of where, after Halo 2, FPS is all I've ever played since then. I did going over to my buddy's house that first night. I definitely did not sleep. I stayed <laughs> up all night playing uh, Halo 2 online, just addicted. Yeah, dude, going over to friends' houses when we were younger and just playing video games for 24 hours straight was definitely mm -hmm. the vibe of my childhood, too. Um, it's funny you mentioned the GameCube, and it's funny you mentioned your little brother, because I might have heard a little story that you sold your GameCube to your little brother, but then continue just to play it whenever you want. Yeah, I definitely scammed him. <laughs> I definitely scammed him. I don't know how I got it. My mom okayed it, okay? So we should probably <laughs> run this by my mom as well. But he paid me $20 for the GameCube, but the stipulation was that I got to play it whenever I wanted. <laughs> so he basically just gave me 20 bucks for yeah, right. ownership. <laughs> and your mom just so, notarized the transaction. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. She got a cut, I guess. Um, in high school, did you play sports or what was your high school uh, life like? Uh, if you guys are enjoying this interview, please subscribe. We have a lot more on the way. Yeah, I mean, early on in high school, I went from a um, like that private school growing up into a public school. And that was kind of like a culture shock for me so yeah. i didn't really have friends the first year of high school basically until sports started but i was always pretty good at sports so as soon as like the I think it was basketball started up then i made all my friends and kind of hung out with them um through that but i was at that age already i was obsessed with uh with working out and training so i would just get home play basketball till it was nighttime go out in the uh the barn and work out go back to school do it again the next day early on at least uh once i started getting a little bit more friends then I would try to man I, I was pretty sheltered growing up I really was I think I heard my first swear word when I was in the fifth grade my parents <laughs> didn't swear like no one around me did so I remember going home and telling my mom like mom what does this word mean <laughs> so going from a private to a public school was a pretty big shock there but um going from like I said sheltered to kind of like here's a little bit of the world I yeah. wanted to try to experience all of it so I think it was probably sophomore year 
Uh, I kind of got out of training consistently and played video games some on the weekends. We just wanted to party. We were mm-hmm. just trying to go, you know, do the uh, the dumb high school kid thing, really. Yeah. <laughs> and you mentioned training. You Your name, Iron, comes from that um, that passion or that obsession with, with working out, right? You were training to be a bodybuilder? Yeah, yeah. Iron Addict was my uh, original name. <laughs> Um, and I should have patented it. I had it before CT Fletcher. I will say that it's like a <laughs> supplement line. Yeah. Not initially when I first started training. Well, I guess I didn't really have enough knowledge to say I wanted to be a bodybuilder early, early on when I was training. I just, I mean, as soon as you, if you're like a young male and you look at a weight, you're probably going to put on a little bit of muscle. And as soon as you see that any sort of improvement, you just become obsessed. And I just dove headfirst into it. All of the books that I could possibly read, all the videos that I could watch. So I saw like uh, <clears throat> Ronnie Coleman, mm-hmm. um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jay Cutler, Ronnie and Jay, that was like, they were big at that time. So yeah. having like, I got this huge book with Ronnie on the cover, like I don't even remember what it was called, but Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding or something. Yeah. Trial and error through there. Try a workout, see how it works. Overtrain most likely. <laughs> yeah. How far did it go? Like, did you get, were you doing competitions or anything like that? No, I had a, a shape. Bodybuilding is about creating a, a shape online, an illusion, I guess, in, mm-hmm. in some ways. And I had an idea of what I wanted my shape to look like when I stepped on stage the first time. So I put in eight years of like very, very dedicated bodybuilding work with like no cheat meals. I had a year's worth of journals, every food that I had ever eaten, written down, measured all of it, like a a level of obsession that, well, is necessary if you wanted to make it, (laughs) but definitely is not healthy uh, for most, if not all. (sighs) But uh, yeah, I just... I never stepped on stage because I never reached that level of in of that shape that I wanted to to have. I was close to it though, for sure. Um, I did take uh, take steroids to get there, and when I came off my first cycle of them, I got in a huge depression, mm. and that kind of like derailed a lot of it. So I didn't really uh, do that correctly, and I probably would have needed to do another two cycles of them to even get to the place that I wanted to. Which, I mean, I, I accepted that I was going to have to do that when I got into it. So. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the only way. Like, any of those bodybuilders mm-hmm. you see are obviously juiced out of their gills. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do Is steroids still big? I mean, I'm sure steroids are still big in bodybuilding, but has HGH and TRT kind of taken over some of that? Or, or how does that fit into the role now of, of modern-day bodybuilding? Well, if you're talking about the professional bodybuilders, it's almost not possible to stand or to become a pro unless it's like a, unless they're competing in the natural division. But if you're talking about the open class, the, like you said, those guys are just juiced out of their minds. And it's not just use, it's extreme abuse. So when you talk about like TRT and growth, like a, a standard TRT dose would be like, we'll just throw out random numbers, 250 milligrams a week um, to try to get it to a, a healthy, level of testosterone for an adult male, they're mm-hmm. taking 10 to 20 times that amount. Sure. So TRT is testosterone. They're taking sim- They're taking the same thing, just 20 times the amount. And right. then they're stacking it with three, four, five, six other things. Same <laughs> with HGH. It's, uh, they're taking 10 times the amount that you would, uh, the doctor would ever recommend yeah. you taking. When did you get out of bodybuilding? I mean, you mentioned that after your first cycle of steroids, you know, you fell into a depression. Was that kind of when you just fell out of bodybuilding in general, or did you keep going after that? And, and if so, what, what kind of got you out of it? Yeah, no, that was um, that was definitely when I got out of it. it. When I was in that like big depression, I had my entire life, really, well, my entire young adult life up to that point, and my identity had been in bodybuilding. Mm-hmm. So when I like tried to take a step back, it was super rough to uh, really even have conversations with people because everybody knew me as, you know, that's that's uh, Stefan. He's going to be Mr. Olympia because that's what I'd tell people. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, like, I'm, I'm about to be Mr. O. You know, that's the level of like certainty that I had with it. <clears throat> um, so it was it was really tough mentally and then realizing how selfish it was. I um, it's an extremely lonely and selfish sport, especially when you take it to the level of uh, extremism or the level of extreme that I did. I lived like 15 minutes from my parents and I saw them two, three times a year, maybe. 
all I did was eat, sleep, train, repeat. <laughs> and if I did yeah. see them, like for Christmas or Thanksgiving, I'm bringing my own meals. I'm not like enjoying it with everybody else. Like I'm irritated if I'm not eating at the right times or I'm trying to go home and sleep because I need to train, you know? So it's just, I was not a very um, good person to be around, especially for my family at that time. Yeah. So that's, that was a, it was eye opening for sure. I mean, I can imagine it just consumes everything if you want to get to that level that you were trying to get to. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, mm -hmm. After high school, then did you go to college or were you so, super focused on training? And if so, did you go right into the workforce or, or what happened after high school? Yep. After high school, I, I kind of like bummed around for like half a year uh, at my girlfriend's house at the time. And then I was training the entire time. So it's not like I was doing like absolutely nothing. I was training my butt off, like still chasing that dream. Then got into uh, the workforce. Um, at a supplement shop selling vitamins, minerals, protein powders, stuff like that. Kind of where my uh, love and um, knowledge of supplements come from. Yeah. I worked in there for five, six years. Uh, I didn't want to climb that corporate ladder. I just kind of like saw where it was. And I was like, no, I'm good. Went to back to school um, and then kind of saw the... Uh, I don't want to say it's not a scam, obviously, but if you don't know what you're going to do going into college that's a yikes dude. yeah you have to 100%. know exactly exactly what you want to do and it doesn't even need to necessarily be uh <clears throat> well i guess if i say it another way like it should be something very specific for uh like a goal or a dream that you have and i just didn't have that when i was younger i didn't know that hey i wanted to run a business i need to know these things i had no clue so i was just like oh well i kind of enjoy uh math let's just go for engineering and i spent two years doing not that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> spending all this money to do not that at all. And I was just like, dude, I learned all this stuff already. I don't need to be here. I'm sick of this. So I just went back and started chasing a different dream, basically. Yeah. I mean, I didn't expect to get into this, but yeah, I mean, you, you bring up a good point. I mean, you're 18 years old and people are like, well, what are you going to do for the rest of your life? And you basically just <laughs> go right into college, which is what I did. Went to University of Wisconsin uh, for criminal justice, which has nothing to do with what I do now. I, I run a web design development company. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I spent three and a half years or four years just literally partying and drinking and taking criminal justice classes and just wasted, you know, an insane amount of money, <laughs> not knowing what I was going to do. But it's like, yeah, you almost need to, you should definitely figure out like what you want to do kind of before you get into college. And, and the way like the society is set up a little bit, it's just kind of like, well, it doesn't really matter. Just go in there, take some, you know, take some of the general courses and, and you'll, you'll figure it out. But you know, if you don't, well, Hey, now you're. 50 grand in debt and good luck <laughs> it, it's, it's exactly. kind of crazy so most of the stuff now too uh it, it really is just about understanding a certain level of work that needs to be put in which i guess college uh in 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 ways definitely teaches you that but if you can learn that through other means then you'll be totally fine especially in today's world where i mean you have unlimited access to all the information in the world yeah. at your fingertips you know, you can you can figure out anything if you want to. Yeah, I mean, some of my most successful friends just became like um, electrical apprentices right out of high mm -hmm. school and they are making insane money. You know what I mean? It is crazy. <laughs> so, yeah, um, they were the smart ones. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. Um, so you are working at the supplement shop. Um, and what's your first introduction then to streaming? Like, do, how do you discover streaming? I guess. I mean, I'm a little older than you, so. Streaming like wasn't even a thing until I don't know, at least I didn't know about it until probably even like mid college after college. What was your first introduction to streaming? Oh, uh, let's see. Um, Destiny, Destiny one. I think the first time I ever watched a stream was the Vault of Glass or maybe Crota, one of those first um, raids. And I watched King Gathalion. Um, and he's, he's a pretty entertaining dude as well. I think he's doing his thing on Facebook or some, some, uh, different platform other than Twitch, I believe, but he was on Twitch at the time and I watched him and I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. Like I love video games. And then my buddy glad G L A D D. Um, since the doc's not on Twitch, I've been saying he's the most entertaining dude on the platform. Hands down. Can't watch him with your kids, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, uh, he's so, so funny. And he, me and him were playing long before he ever even thought about streaming. And then we would do low man destiny challenges and there'd be two viewers, me and him for him. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and then uh, he became at one point the most sub two streamer on Twitch uh, with uh, one of his crazy. It wasn't even a subathon. He just 
just goes on these super long stream binges and extremely generous people throwing subs and it was nuts and that was kind of what gave me the confidence to quit my job and go for it i was like okay if glad can do this I've, I've been there right with him doing the same stuff i know i can do it too so uh, also in destiny the uh clan that um we're in redeem is pretty well known so if you're in like the well pretty well known in the destiny pve community i'll say sure. select a group of nerds knows about them <laughs> and everybody in the clan if they decide they want to stream or try to stream they have an audience just because of the redeem in the clan tag at least at that time okay yeah uh, tifu was another member of that clan nice. back in the day so sweat modern a lot of gamer gamers <laughs> that uh, are extremely good at whatever they do and have done some like super cool crazy things so um that was my what gave me the confidence to go for it was seeing the success of my buddy glad so i was there from the beginning and then see him climb to what he is i was like i can do this too and so even before you started your first actual stream um again i got a little bit of inside information from your little brother but he mentioned <laughs> that uh you would practice streaming, playing PUBG to like three or four in the morning, like quietly under your breath, like explaining what you're doing. But you guys shared a room, so he heard everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me and my brother shared a room for the majority of our lives. I heard him, him hearing me <laughs> go through that and get the reps in was a uh, payback for me listening to him play Dark Souls. <laughs> <laughs> so even before you started streaming, you decided I'm going to quit my job and I'm going all into streaming. Or did you stream a little bit before you you, you uh, quit that job? I went all in. <laughs> if you can't tell by the little bit so far, that's <laughs> the only way that I really do things. Yeah. Is that I'm just I jump head first straight into it. I just had like a little bit of a logistics problem because like I said um, early on, I grew up in the middle of nowhere. So even when I was playing PUBG, uh, I was playing off of my phone's hotspot. I had <laughs> terrible, terrible internet and I couldn't stream off that. So I was like, I was trying to still live at my parents' house and start streaming. I was calling, uh, you know, internet companies, seeing how much it would cost to dig a line. I called <laughs> pretending that I'm like some big business owner, like how much, how much is it going to cost for me to just dig a line all the way, you know, yeah. and 20 grand was the number that they gave me. And I was like, okay, that's not happening. <laughs> so I had to find like a little uh, one bedroom in the middle of Kalamazoo. It ended up having that brick wall. And um, I just I quit my job and got my PC. Uh, Zam was the man, is the guy who helps everybody in Redeem. He's like a mod for Tifu, helped me build the uh, entire PC, walked me through the whole process, told me what to get, and then basically set up my entire stream setup for that first stream like nice. all in one night. So he's just like huge shout out to Zam. He's the man. Heck yeah. But yep, yeah, that was head first, man. <laughs> That's awesome. So your first stream, um, walk me through <laughs> kind of like the first, I don't know, couple months, you know, I'm, I'm guessing it's just again, well, I guess it's not just you watching because you have kind of a built in audience a little bit with Redeem, but walk me through like those first couple months of streaming. Like, you know, what is the growth like and, and what are you thinking? Um, yeah, well, I got, let's get pretty lucky with Glad. Um, he helped me out a lot right when I first started streaming. Um, before I even before I even did my first stream, he shouted at that time he was streaming to probably two and a half to three thousand people okay. at first stream. And he shouted me out then. I got the amount of followers that I needed to get affiliate. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay, sweet. Yeah. Uh, started up stream and I played with him for like the first week straight. Mm. And which was a huge, huge boost, obviously. When you get that type of exposure right off the rip, I mean, Twitch or any live streaming, obviously you can you can have what it takes, but if you just don't kind of find your niche or get the exposure from somebody or something, an article, an interview, something, then it's going to be real tough for you right. to really get any sort of traction. So that was, that was huge. Um, first week was with him, and then it was tough, too, because I get used to averaging, you know, 40, 50 viewers my first week. I was like, hey, this is going to go real well, dude. And then uh, I don't play with Glad and then stream at the same time as him, and it just tanked. And I was just like, dang it, man, I got to really <laughs> rethink. Like, if I cannot stream at the same time as him mm -hmm. if I unless I'm playing with him. But um, at the same time, he did the Verdance-type streams that I was throwing out 20, 30 hours. That's what he does, too. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how we gravitated playing together. So it's just like, well, I don't want to not stream for <laughs> a day and a half. I can't afford that if I'm going to try to make it. So it was just a weird balancing act of 
trying to start towards the end of his stream maybe or if i catch uh, it was all around his stream schedule which mm -hmm. is just the reality of what it is if you get the majority of your viewers from somebody else's exposure it is it is what it is it's funny i don't know if you heard the bread man interview i did with them but he actually described like a very similar situation except you're in the role of glad in that situation and he is you and he was talking about you know all the exposure he got from playing with you and then purposely trying to stream when you were not streaming and how impossible that was because you were doing 24 hour streams and, <laughs> and things like that. And he finally realized like, Hey, I got to break off from this and kind of build my own audience now that I got this great base from, from iron. But he was super appreciative of all that as well, obviously. He's a good dude. Um, so you're growing, uh, you were doing like 40, you know, when you're with glad you're doing less with, without glad, you know, what's your first big jump maybe to like where you're doing, I don't know, 50 on your own, uh, in your opinion? Um, well, it was kind of the same thing that I had done before I ever started streaming with glad. It was just low man challenges. That's what redeem was known for. So we'd do like solo zero hour speed runs and just like helping out people get certain guns or emblems or whatever armor, um, in destiny <laughs> or trials carries like grabbing somebody from chat, getting them to the lighthouse, stuff like that. So just helping people in the community was the best way for me to kind of grow from that 40 to, you know, 60, 70. Mm -hmm. But then I kind of got well, a similar situation to when Warzone 2 came out where I just got super frustrated with the game. Destiny was in a very similar situation where it was just like, if you cared about the game, it was frustrating to play because there was no real like, reason to progress your skill mm -hmm. as long as you had like a certain level of it you could do everything in the game with your eyes closed and if i'm not seeing progress or knowing that i'm progressing and like have this end goal that i'm chasing then it's not a healthy version of myself at all so i just kind of uh like spiraled into grumpiness <laughs> which has happened multiple times it just i, I got, i'm still working on that but <clears throat> um then yeah stream kind of took like a, a big dip there until cod basically mm -hmm. which is a couple months did you play cod before warzone oh yeah i um man, world at war was my very first cod okay and this kind of goes back to the high school conversation uh but me and my buddy mainly me <laughs> would uh stay up all weekend and grind search and destroy leaderboards that was that was our thing that was my thing after high school um when i would just uh, still play by myself even when i was bodybuilding it just wasn't the same hours as i was doing um before or in high school where sure. i would just stay up all all night because i needed to get my sleep i needed to get my meals but i still game but search and destroy from world at war until advanced warfare or something like that where whenever you started boosting all over the place i was over that <laughs> yeah that's i think when i started playing destiny okay or whatever game was out at that time halo for destiny whatever yeah one of those two and so warzone drops what's your what were you doing um in terms of numbers on stream uh before warzone dropped like what was your average concurrent would you say 30 okay M at most i mean i would have some streams it depends a lot of the time on uh who's streaming and who's not or what time yeah. of the day as well but i would say 30 before warzone okay. uh, at the, actually i had broken away from destiny um it's kind of one of those things, uh, I guess, a different direction than um, Breadman took it. But I wanted to get away from Destiny completely because I just kind of realized the Destiny directory was very capped. It wasn't really going to grow. The people who uh, were the big names had like a they basically had a corner on all of the people who were watching. And if you were streaming at any of the time as them, you were pretty much screwed. So I wanted to branch away completely and I went to PUBG, which was actually the biggest, uh, the best thing that I could have done for my mouse and keyboard skills. Mm. Destiny is a very easy game. PUBG, extremely difficult, it requires a ton of practice. And I played that on stream for like two, three months, maybe, and just kind of threw away the viewership number, even though like I was using, I was trying to pay bills, <laughs> you yeah. know? I just needed to not get in my head about it and just focus on something that I could put my all into. And that was that was huge for me. So even if my viewership was lower, I was loving it again, instead of just getting frustrated with Destiny. And um, so yeah, before Warzone dropped, I would like play a little bit of uh, multiplayer because I knew there was gonna be a BR mm -hmm. in uh, 2019. And that was obviously not the first BR I've played. I had grinded PUBG leaderboards on console, 
and Blackout leaderboards on console and been top 10 for PUBG solos and duos for like a year and or however long I wanted to basically until Blackout came out. And then in Blackout, I was number one for solo wins and number six overall for wins. Um, so when Warzone came out, I was like, okay, this is it. I, I like mm-hmm. knew that everything was like kind of like coming to this one this one moment, the Eminem song, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I knew that that was my moment. I knew it was. Nice. So I, I switched to PUBG to get better at the game. And then I already had my team going in, the team that I had grinded Blackout leaderboards with. And uh, my buddy Mike Bot, who I was, who was my duos partner in PUBG. Like I just had everything ready to go, um, and yeah. So thirty leading up to it, and it was kind of a slower start mm-hmm. when Warzone dropped. You know, it, was, it slowly kind of climbed because I was putting in good hours and we were winning all, like every game. But it really wasn't until the J got vid that thing just kind of everything just rolled from there. Okay. So yeah, I was gonna ask you, you know, like what's your first major step then in Warzone? So Jay God drops a video. Uh talk about what that video is about. Um you know that he put out about you. Yeah, it was the uh like how the number one player in Warzone wins what, seventy five percent or fifty percent of his games or whatever it was. And so you were number one on the leaderboard at that time when you put out that video? Uh yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I was averaging seventy five to a hundred. Okay, and then the video comes out and it just jumps like crazy. The very next day, like five hundred. <laughs> that was the. I mean, that's huge. You know? Yeah, of course. Yeah, seventy five to five hundred, and then my and Glad, my buddy, messaged me uh, on Discord as I was like the last hour of that stream. It was like a twelve hour stream. You know, normal <laughs> normal numbers for that time. And he was like, "Don't end stream. Keep going." Because he's just like, "You got to nice. just ride this." And I was just like, I was just like, I'm just gonna wake up and do it again tomorrow. Like I'm not doing anything different. I believe it's gonna work out. This is what I've been like working towards. Next day, 800. You know, the day after, 1100. It just kept on going all the way to, I mean, I don't even know what number. It just yeah. never really stopped for like a year. And it was just consistent growth like that, like day after day. Every day, yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, so you decide you're gonna be number one on the leaderboard, and you're holding that. You know, you're you're number one in the world. You're getting a lot of growth from that. You know. What does it take to, to to maintain that? You know, how much stress is that? Was the game still fun for you when you're when you're trying to just be, you know, that number one on on the board for wins? Uh, obsession. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> obsession. They're going back to the body the theme, thing where yeah. I got yep. yeah, where I have the uh, the notebooks, years of food that you know I weighed everything, I counted everything. That it's just that level of obsession. Mm-hmm. I would get off of the game. And I would immediately watch my stream back. I had like three, four games that I that we lost where I was like, okay, where was the mistake? Yeah. Like, uh, like film. You yeah, know? you're watching the all 22. <clears throat> exactly. <laughs> uh, I would watch players that I was trying to take things from. Uh, Huskers, Symphony, Tifu, if he played. Just mouse and key players, basically. Yeah. That um, were significantly more mechanically skilled than me. And I could try to you know, take one of their things they do like Husker centering, uh, symphonies like flicks or like, <laughs> yeah. you know, stuff like that. And Turner is kind of hard to replicate because he's just the best at he's everything freak, he does. Dude. But any game yeah. he plays, he could like literally play for the first time and win. It's insane. Yeah. I, I was trying to tell people that it's just like, if you just heard of uh Tifu and Fortnite, you don't even really know, man, it's just every game that he's ever played. He's that good at. I only know him so. from fishing. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> IRA takes it into IRL. You know? I know, it's crazy. So, sorry, to answer the uh, previous question's second part, I was having a blast, man. With that like, with that level of, of obsession, um, all that mattered in my life at that point was getting better and winning at mm-hmm. the video game. That's all that mattered. So every single game, like not making any mistakes or there's like certain feelings that I would chase within the game, sometimes in solo, sometimes in quads. Depends on my mood, but a lot of a lot of the times when you're wind grinding, it's quads. If you want to like be serious about it, you pretty much need the most people and the best. <laughs> yeah. And uh, when you can just like call everything perfectly, and it feels like a like a book that you've read before or music that you've listened to a thousand times. That's what the game that's happening in real time feels like. That's such an addicting feeling. Yeah. So I was just like, I would chase that day after day after day to just like a, like a composer in an orchestra <laughs> was the, uh, the feeling that I was chasing. I could just like consistently hit it. And it was just like a high that you're just living off of. So you're, you're grinding the leaderboard, you're number one. Um, you're getting some backlash for your play style for just playing for the win. There was people who were playing a battle royale, more like team deathmatch and kills was all that mattered to them. But 
you got a lot of heat for being the most famous camper, you know, in, in the world, basically. <laughs> were you expecting that backlash? And, and it probably wasn't the majority. It's probably just the loud minority. But were you expecting the some of the hate that you got for playing for the win? As I, I understood that it was uh, that it was COD. You know, just see red dot, chase red dot. The yeah. viewer base or the average player age is probably not super old. And I was just trying to play a BR. So like I said, I didn't really care too much about the uh, the hate that I would get from people because I had already grinded BRs in PUBG and Blackout. Mm -hmm. I had been like like held leaderboard positions. I knew how to win them. So I was just like, I'm just going to try to optimize all of the mechanics and advantages that this game offers and just smoke everybody. <laughs> yeah, I was watching. Um, so I think early on, like I think Reed Boy had the number one spot for a while. Uh, had from uh australia he had it for a little while and i was just watching their uh gameplay and they were playing like the uh, old cod style you know like still which is impressive yeah <laughs> first off so that they can just run around and kill the entire lobby and still win <laughs> the vast majority of their games is impressive but i was just, like watching like the win numbers and like kind of adding up and i was like okay i can actually get this i can definitely get number one so I'd, I'd grinded it before didn't really care what anybody else thought about the way that i was playing the game but also when my viewership was climbing like crazy, it's pretty easy to just disregard people that are coming in. Yeah. And like, oh, you camping rad? And it's like, bro, I'm playing video <laughs> games for a living. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, obviously, lots of people like that style because your viewership speak, speaks for itself. I mean, you know, people were learning from you and all they want to do was learn how to win as well. So, I mean, you know, like I said, I think it was probably the 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 minority, but just the loud minority that, that would come in and and get mm -hmm. something off calling you a camper but no obviously yeah. a lot of people uh were there to learn so it was awesome yeah that 13 to 17 crowd is tough <laughs> somewhere along the way you decide that holding that number one spot is super important to you and your stream is blowing up and that's obviously super important to you um obviously there's massive financial gain that comes from that as well um you start doing 20 30 possibly even 48 hour streams you know what is that? What's what's that thought thought, thought process like for you um, when you're doing those marathon streams? Uh, I mean, it's just like that that obsession. Nothing else. That was before I was a dad too. Yeah, right. So nothing else in my life mattered except that, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. So it was very easy to justify my basically abuse of myself with the you know the super super long streams, and I think I put on probably almost a hundred pounds. <laughs> yeah. um, it, I was I was terribly unhealthy. I had like bad kidney stones, but going from working in a uh, a retail setting making you know pennies compared to what I was making at that time, I was just it was so easy to justify abusing myself to just keep on grinding because it was just like uh, I could get done with streaming. But like I just made what I would, it would take me six months to make in my last job in like right. one stream. <laughs> yeah. And it was just like, it was crazy to even think about. So, and I remember how upset I was during those six months. Like I, I remember telling myself that too, at that retail job that I never wanted to feel that feeling again. Mm -hmm. of just being super frustrated, doing some mundane tasks that somebody else told me to do that didn't matter. I was over it, man. Yeah. So <clears throat> when I was actually like doing what I love to do, even if like, all the other areas in my life weren't really improving. Like I still had a lot to work on in myself, but just seeing that success in one area was easy for me to justify to myself at that time. Yeah, and you talked about, you know, putting your health aside and we talked about during bodybuilding, doing steroids, you know, what does it take to do streams that are that long? Are you taking any enhancers to, to, to go for 30 hours plus? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we can, we can get into this if you want. I think I've talked about it on stream a couple times. I was completely and utterly addicted to ADHD medication. That's the only way that it's possible, really. Like if doing those crazy hour streams for that, like that level of focus too for that long, like you could be 25 hours in and I was still like laser focused. Yeah. It's because I had uh, enough Adderall to wake up an elephant from a dead sleep. You know, it was just, it was, I mean, that attributed a ton to um, in my health. Uh, decline in health at that time and then i guess it decline mentally in other ways even though if i'm you know 
successful in, in one area of my life. Like I said, there were so many other areas of my life that were just like declining hard mm -hmm. over that time that I was e ignoring because it was easy to do. And once again, all that mattered, eat, sleep, grind. And I, I loved living in those modes. But yeah, this definitely uh, performance enhancers. And like I said, I've talked about it on stream a few times. It's one of the, it's, it's a weird thing because for me, it was one of the most enjoyable times of my life. But then when I look back at it, it's just like, man, it, who I was at that point is like hard to really uh, <clears throat> be proud of, you know? And I mean, you talked about how easy it is to justify. I mean, you went from, you know, you're working at a supplement job that you hated, probably not paying super well to making the best money you've ever made in your life. So, I mean, everyone justifies things in their mind, whether it's good for them or not. You know, it's easy to justify things and even easier in mm -hmm. that case. You know, did did people in your life know about, you know, the the Adderall abuse and, you know, were they worried about you? Um, did you have any support in that or, or what was the process like for um, when you eventually we'll talk about the, you know, getting off of it. But, you know, in, mm -hmm. in the actual heat of the moment, you know, did, did people know what was going on? Uh, I don't think anybody besides my family, my family, um, they knew. Yeah. Uh, but and obviously they were definitely worried. Yeah. Wanting me to go to like, well, I, it wasn't even really take care of myself because I was always the one that took care of myself, it, like physically. So it was kind of weird for them to tell me to do that when my dad's sitting there smoking a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, they were they were definitely worried about me for sure. I don't know how much my um, siblings knew, but my mom and dad for sure. Yeah, uh, I would imagine my my little brother was probably like proud at, you know, seeing seeing me do what I was doing, but he had to have known. Mm -hmm. that something was going on for sure yeah um so let's talk about quitting because obviously i mean if anyone doesn't know adhd adderall especially is super addictive and there's a lot of negative side effects that can come with abuse including like hallucinations and stuff you know how bad did it get i guess you know what was the the breaking point where you're like i gotta stop doing this it was almost a forced um quit that then i made the decision myself to do when i moved to florida my ability to get it stopped so at, and at that point too like i was just being a dad <laughs> and yeah. i was trying to figure out that whole thing emma was just born emma was born moved to florida and i would still take some sometimes in a much better dose much more normal dose mm -hmm. but i basically kind of uh, at one point would just realize like this is not what i can do anymore i need to just cut cold turkey and um just rebuild myself basically yeah <laughs> mentally is that kind of when your streams became more sporadic and i mean you basically mm -hmm. kind of disappeared for like a couple of months is that you basically going through the withdrawal and trying to rebuild iron as a as a human as a dad uh well yes to short answer the question mm -hmm. um there was other things going on in my life at that time it was a <laughs> life has its has its ways of kind of like throwing and piling things on at one time and that was 100 percent it for me yeah i just had everything put like like uh just hurled on top of me and i was just trying to deal with all of it without my superman pill <laughs> yeah which was extremely difficult mm -hmm. and you know my the center of my universe shifted from my performance uh in, in going from my performance in the gym uh, to my performance online in a video game to now it's not even about me anymore. Yeah, <laughs> I got a little princess, you know, so whew. It, it was it was a shock for sure. And I basically had to uh, I had a lot of growing up to do and I had to relearn what discipline was, mm -hmm. I think was probably the biggest thing because in bodybuilding, well, I guess not even relearn. I had to learn period what discipline was because I had had there's a very fine line for some very obvious wide mile gap for others the difference between discipline and obsession and all that i had known in my life at that point was obsession i didn't know discipline yet i thought that i did because i was like there's nobody more disciplined i weigh everything i I'd never miss a training session i'll uh i'll never make a mistake in game you know like mm -hmm. i may miss a shot but it's not going to be a mental error yeah <clears throat> so it went from that was ruling all of my thoughts to to then like trying to rebuild myself actually teaching myself discipline and what it actually meant to uh to always be there for my daughter whenever i possibly could and to uh, make sure not just there physically um but 
there would be times where it would be after like a long stream, I'd be able to see her for a little bit. And I was just zonked, dude. After after a 30 hour stream or 24 <laughs> hour stream of, like I said, taking a way too much um, ADHD medication, you and then when you stop, there's like a very not just like stop cold turkey period, but when you're done taking it for the day, you can't fall asleep right away because mm -hmm. it's still in your system. But you are not a benefit to anybody. You're just kind of like a lard just sitting there that your body is just completely fried and your mind is still zipping way faster than you want it to to be able to like chill out or even breathe and do normal things, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was while she was like real, real young. So it's not like she was running all over the place, but just sure. even getting up off the couch was just like a chore, I thought. And I was just kind of like, what am I doing, man? Just knew that it couldn't continue. I mean, when you get off a medication like that, you know, your brain uh, chemistry has changed a bit. You stop naturally producing dopamines and things like that. You <laughs> yeah. probably know more about it than I do. But, you know, walk me through the recovery process. You know, I, and by the way, the reason I kind of want to go into this, is I think it's important for other people who are thinking about maybe doing it to, to hear about your, your struggle and your journey and what it's like to get off of it. So, you know, getting off of that, you know, you decide to quit, which is great. And you disappeared for a little bit, which I think is great because I don't think anyone could blame you for wanting to fix yourself over your stream. And you have a daughter now, it's the most important thing, but circling all the way back, you know, what's the recovery process like for you? How hard is that? Well, I will say that my, you're right. The dopamine, your brain just basically relies on it completely to produce any sort of dopamine. So the day wouldn't start for me until I had whoever knows how many milligrams. Yeah. Um, and it didn't start producing it again for a while, <laughs> a while. It wasn't like I stopped taking uh, Adderall and then next week I'm just like, oh, I have a feel good hormone again. It was <laughs> yeah. months and months and months where I didn't feel like doing anything. And then at the same time, Warzone 2 came out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was, like, that was kind of like another thing just kind of piled on top. Not as important as the other things, obviously, but yep. went from the best video game, arguably, that I'd ever played next to PUBG, going to the absolute worst in Warzone 2. I hated that game. And then I felt like I was right back into uh, working in the retail job is what, is what Warzone 2 felt like to me. Mm -hmm. So it was just like all the stuff going on, IRL, no dopamine. Um, that was, I started training again, which was one of the best things that I could have possibly done was, uh, was start working out. Because whenever, like any point in my life, I've gone through a couple like highs and lows, as most probably have. Whenever I'm in a low, it's, it's a guarantee that I'm not training, guarantee. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I start adding that back in, um, everything started to kind of slowly get better and better. It was, uh, it was definitely a marathon, not a sprint, you yeah. know, especially with, uh, with Warzone 2. And I won't get into a lot of the personal stuff going on outside of that. Sure. Getting over, I'll, I'll put it this way. I will say getting over the um, that or all addiction was not the hardest thing that I did over that, that year. Okay. It was just a lot of a lot of other stuff that was going on. Uh, but it didn't help <laughs> it made it more difficult yeah um but yeah, training was was huge and then just uh being super present for my daughter is what i live for yeah and and i know you moved more to like the northern end of florida and you started a journey back to fitness and you started streaming um some of your fitness journey i, I assume that helped tremendously with naturally bringing back some of that dopamine um and getting back to normal um but getting back into fitness is, is really hard and I think it's something a lot of people can relate to. What's your recommendation for the average person? Maybe not not iron, but the average person to to kind of get back into fitness if that's what they're looking to do. Yeah, I've gotten in shape and out of shape multiple times, so I kind of have like a blueprint for how I how I do it. Yeah. I, but during the Verdance days, I got way way out of shape. Like I said, I ballooned up to probably close to three hundred pounds. I know that when I stepped on a scale at one point, I was two eighty, but that was already when I had moved to South Florida. So that yeah. wasn't even when I was in like the worst in uh, in Michigan. So it was probably near three hundred. And walking is the first thing. It's an extremely underrated exercise. The biggest part of it, though, period, if we're gonna start from the beginning, is what you eat. It's the hardest thing. That's why everybody who doesn't work out is uh, just jacked and shredded. <laughs> they may <laughs> they may have some like decent sized muscles, but to get like 
lean requires uh, either phenomenal genetics or a lot of knowledge about what you're eating. And a lot of the people that, especially in America today, the food that we have in our grocery stores is basically just meant to push you towards big pharma. And then <laughs> big pharma just keeps you kind of trapped, you know, not sick enough to, uh, to die, but not healthy enough to be without their medication. So the food, food and whatnot is, it's poison, basically. The majority of the food in America is poison. Mm -hmm. So learning, uh, learning what you can eat, what you can't. And I had gotten, when we go back to those uh, Verdance days, I, my diet during those times, holy, uh, I would wake up in the morning, have like two smoothies from Smoothie King with everything in it, uh, <laughs> ice cream, peanut butter, masking or shake, whatever. I thought I needed the calories. I'm like, this is like those chess grandmasters is what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> they burn this many calories just sitting there. I would have two of those, probably a cut, like a, at least 1,500 calories each. And then post stream, I'd have like a triple cheeseburger from five guys with like half a dozen cookies, all fries. And that's it. I would just do that back and forth. So no wonder I bloomed up to that. Yeah, right. <laughs> but having to, like breaking those eating habits and just learning, everyone's different as well. Uh, learning what your body likes, what it doesn't. Usually I recommend people uh, stick to kind of, first off, the outside of the grocery stores. If it's not meat, eggs, um, fruit, vegetables, maybe a little bit of dairy. I don't have any currently, but have in the past. I don't think it's the worst if you limit it. Mm -hmm. um, and just eating whole foods, cooking it yourself. I cook with uh, avocado, or sorry, um, olive oil for the most part. Um, and then weighing things, I think it's pretty eye-opening if you don't weigh your food, which is something that I did in bodybuilding all the time, so I was no stranger to it. Uh, the amount of calories that you can ingest gets out of control real quick if you uh, if you don't weigh it. So that's that's first and foremost, you need to be in control of what you put in your mouth. And nowadays, especially, it's way too easy. After you get done working for 10 hours, you just want to grab something on the way home. Even if they yep. give you a supplement facts and the total amount of calories in uh, on the back of a Big Mac and you're just like, oh, well, I'll just put that into my uh, my fitness calorie. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, they can be off by law like 20 percent. Mm. So they could have two, three hundred more calories in that in that sandwich than they're telling you. Um, and that's most likely what's happening in all of these places. So you got to cook your own food, know what you're putting in your body. But getting back to the exercise part, um, walking to start calisthenics and yoga. I think are probably the uh, the best things that you can do for somebody who's a beginner. And I think those are also the things that you can do as somebody who's advanced. Um, calisthenics have like a, you can start at just like a simple push up, and then you can go from that and go all the way up to like a muscle up. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge range of different skills and levels of difficulty in calisthenics. Same thing with yoga. You could sit there in a, in a a uh, downward dog for a couple minutes or whatever and then you can get into some crazy like crow positions and just huge levels of difficulty beginner intermediate and advanced and those two things i think that no matter who you are if you want your fitness to be functional should keep those two things as like a base of your training um <clears throat> so for the first six months of getting back in shape i was walking a couple miles a day I would do like a 10 to 15 minute dumbbell or calisthenics workout where I'm just doing air squats, push ups, um, you know, shoulder to overhead with some dumbbells, just basic stuff. Mm -hmm. Just type into YouTube, like full body dumbbell workout, boom, there's going to be 20 different people, a thousand different videos. It's not hard to find. Yeah. You just got to want to do it. So it just, it, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. I know there's a whole bunch of like crazy stuff out there, yeah. but there's a, there's a reason that the most basic things continue to work and will continue to work. Just move. Yeah, move, move, move. Know what you're putting in your body, and just constantly being obsessed with uh, progressing. And how so, how important is routine in terms of uh, keeping in shape? Long term, it's extremely important. I think that there's definitely um, this is me just getting into my like extremist type mindset where I'll be like, okay, if I don't get any sleep, I still need to train just as hard, if not harder, just because it's a mental battle, like some Goggin style stuff, mm -hmm. um, where he just like loves uphill battles i would say that i absolutely love uphill battles as well but just for like the uh the general person it's going to be huge i um have evolved my morning routine over the past year and a half quite a few different times it went from for me i think morning is the best time to train you would think that after you train hard 
in the morning, you're going to be tired the rest of the day. It's the exact opposite. It's like the best cup of coffee you've ever had in your entire life after you train yeah. like 12 hours, especially if you're eating the right things. That's the biggest thing there. If you're eating the right things combined with that, it doesn't get any better. Mm -hmm. But early on, I was saying I was walking uh, a couple miles a day, get back and do the 10 to 15 minutes. Then a few months uh, after that, I would start rocking, throw on a backpack with 20, 30 pounds, uh, walk for a couple miles, come back and do yoga in the sun. I was starting to add in like these different things that could uh, be more dopamine sources <laughs> yeah, yeah. from being so dopamine starved for so long, you know, trying to right. bring that back. Um, so the sun and the earth and the ocean <laughs> are kind of what I found basically that uh, are the three things that um, combined with physical fitness that I need every day to get like crazy amounts of, of real dopamine, not free dopamine or uh, synthetic dopamine, I guess you could say. No, it's awesome. And yeah, it was really cool for me to watch like you reemerge kind of and you have the fitness stuff going on. And uh, it's just really cool to see you climbing back up that mountain. Um, being a girl dad, I know you love it. You know, where are some of the best things about being a girl dad? <laughs> oh, man. Where to even start? <laughs> uh, the uh, man, who was it? I think it might have been Stephen A. S Smith doesn't say a whole lot of wise things. <laughs> he says a lot of things. <laughs> He says a lot of things. No, he's he's good. He's great at his job. I'm just teasing. Um, one of the things he said though was, "You don't know like there's the best and the worst thing about being a girl dad is you don't know what love is until you become a, a dad, right? You have you have no clue. Like I told girls that I loved them before, <laughs> I laugh at that now. It's, it's just on a completely other world of uh, of care. I think I've described it on stream before of as like. You go from you are the center of your own universe uh, in your car, right? Just just driving down the world or driving down the road. Everything revolves around you to now. It's just like you are a planet rotating around a sun. That's all that matters. It's a complete reality shift. And then you are saying like, that's the that's the worst thing and the best or that was the best thing. And then the worst thing is you had no clue what love is until you became <laughs> a dad. It's just both the same thing because it's just like as soon as she uh came into my life, I just, a lot of hard decisions had to be made. And I was just like, dude, I have to be so much more than I was, you know, so much more. Mm -hmm. So a lot of growing up, a ton of sensitivity. Holy, I mean, it was <laughs> me, and, me and my little brother, you know, like I said, shared a room for the majority of our, uh, of our lives. And there's not a whole lot of feelings talk going on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll just say we, we're both pretty good at just ignoring our feelings. For the most part and just keep on chugging along um but now it's just like the level of sensitivity that especially for what she needs from me is just like so different than i'd ever kind of like given to anybody else so after after stream like she doesn't need it's tough to calm down after stream um just after standing up talking yelling you know being locked in for what six seven eight nine hours at the most now not the 24 before <laughs> yeah. um she when i before i leave the room and see her she does not need me in that mode i need to come down all the way back down to uh the level that she needs mm -hmm. which is just everything is soft everything's sweet you know i'd never <laughs> raise my voice to her she knows she's getting whatever she wants <laughs> you know she knows i'm always going to try to understand what she's trying to tell me but I, just, uh, I love it. Just the sensitivity forcing me to to kind of grow up in so many ways to really be a man. Honestly, mm -hmm. definitely wasn't before I was a dad. I can honestly say that in a lot of different ways too. Not just uh, <clears throat> not just in learning what I what I needed to do to take care of her, but just in in so many ways, just challenged. Yeah, just um, refocus all your priorities. Everything. Yeah. Okay, Iron, as you've probably seen, we've been doing the Mount Rushmore of Warzone. Our Mount Rushmore has five heads. I need to know your Mount Rushmore of Warzone. Okay. I obviously thought a little bit about it. Um, I go back. I feel like I hold a little bit more weight with Warzone 1 than Beyond. Mm -hmm. uh, just I feel like it was so much more popular. So many more people cared. Uh, so that being said... Huskers definitely on that, especially for for me. Like, I mean, he was like the most earned person in tournaments for a long time, and then the highest for mouse and keyboard for a while. It's just I watched a ton of his stream to try to get better, 
and he's just a beast, dude. And he's been doing it the whole time too. Yep. He, he didn't go anywhere. He's been there, and he even did pretty decent at the uh, <laughs> at World Series. Yeah, you know, I was there win, when but... he won that game. I tweeted out, I was like, "There's just something different when Huskers mm-hmm. wins." And he came down to the interview, dude. It was just like it brought me back. I'm like, "This is classic. I love it." Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. I mean, he's a beast, dude. <laughs> he's a beast. Aiden has to be on that. For me, another guy, once again, he's just kind of been there from the beginning. He's always been at the top. Um, and viewership wise for both of these guys too, I think that probably holds a little bit of weight with me as well. They've both just they're they've been there. Yep. They've been there, they've been at the top, and they've been doing it for a long time. Um, J God is definitely in mind. I don't think I watched a uh or sorry, I don't think I read a single patch note. <laughs> it's just it's always just J God vids. Yeah, dude. right. Always. It was so easy. And then obviously uh the video that he made on me, um, I owe him a ton there. Sure. Really. Yeah. So just a huge, huge shout out to J God always. He's uh, obviously an, an amazing human being as well. Mm-hmm. So we gotta put J God up there. Um Biffle. Not much more needs to be said. <laughs> For you, you know. Too. Yeah, he's been he's been the best for a long time. I remember watching the first uh, video on on Biffle, um, and just kind of being like, "Who is this dude?" You know, I'd never heard of him before. No one really had, right? Yeah. And the stuff that he was doing, I was like, "Jeez, man, I I can't do that." <laughs> <laughs> and then I remember I remember the first time I got killed by him in a tournament. It was in a pregame lobby, and I was floating out of the air. You know, this was early in Verdance too, so I'm trying as hard as I can, just yeah. locked. And I was like. <laughs> Uh, serpentining through the air and he was leading me as I was serpentining and I died and I was just like watch the kill cam and I'm sure if the VOD is there I don't think it is but if it was there you just kind of see me like stop and it's kind of like look at the camera and be like wait a second that's <laughs> not normal yeah. <laughs> that's not normal at all so uh, yeah I mean before he's a freak um I know Jay got to put himself on the Mount Rushmore, which I respect. He's on mine. I won't put myself up there. If it was just Warzone 1, then I'd say sure. Um, but I, I just I couldn't stand Warzone 2, so <laughs> I kind of <laughs> definitely kind of took a big step back there. Um, I feel like it's there's a lot of people that you could put up there. Yeah. We're at like what four right we're now? We're at four. We need one more. Yeah, we can talk about honorable mentions too if it makes you feel better, but we need we need the fifth head. I feel like it's gotta be swag. It's tough not to. Yeah. Just because he's been doing so good for so long. You know, even when he's even when he left Twitch and went to YouTube, he was still killing it. Mm-hmm. His his streams and his videos, even when Warzone was in like its worst spot, he's still getting a million views a video. Yep. So it's just like you almost have to put him there. Even uh, I'm, I'm not saying I dislike him. I'm, I'm definitely a fan of Swag. He's a cool dude. Yeah. But even if you dislike him, you still have to give him respect because of what he's done. Yeah. So I mean, he also like in a lot of ways kind of showed people how you can make a crap ton of money in Warzone. You know, he's in commercials and and in all sorts of things. So his brand alone is just elevated way beyond what most people could could even hope for yeah. for playing a video game he's done a great job there for sure all right honorable mentions just to, so you can get get your piece out at least on anyone else <laughs> that you might have left out um i mean you could just go like the huge viewer people even though nick Merck's left his numbers when he played call of duty would still be at the top of the list or near the top of the list like as far as minutes watched sure um tim the tap man Timmy, similar thing course, legend yeah. cloaksy symphony Tifu when they played, <laughs> um, like other people that aren't on that level of you know viewership, which there's only a handful anyway, so there's yeah. nothing wrong with that. Metaphor, I feel like you got to put up there just as far as he's been grinding for a while, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and his, his stream's doing really really well, but he's just a freak, man. I hate going against him in solos. <laughs> I hate it so much. Whenever they're just like metaphors in your game, I'm just like, dang it, dude. Okay. I know, I know. If I don't snipe him from 150 meters away, I'm screwed. <laughs> That's my only shot. So I just uh, I'll say metaphor just because I hate playing against him and I do too often it seems. <laughs> um, all right. This is an age-old debate, keyboard, mouse, first controller, or keyboard, mouse, first aim assist. What's your take on it? Is aim assist too strong? Does it need to be too strong? What are your thoughts on on aim assist versus keyboard, mouse? Well, I actually stopped playing mouse and keyboard for a few months to go to controller. And within uh, 10 days, I set my PR for kills. And that was across all war zones. Yeah. You know, it, it's just... Controller is unbelievably broken as far as aim assist goes. 
that being said, I went back to mouse and keyboard. Um, <clears throat> it just it's more enjoyable. So for me, it's tough because COD is definitely a controller game. It, it, there's they need to make money selling it. <laughs> they're not going to really do that if they're only trying to push mouse and keyboard. Yeah. And the people that they're selling the game to, like the casual player base, is or they may only have four to six hours a week after they get done going to school Monday through Friday, working Monday through Saturday. They get a little bit of time after they uh, put their kids down. You know, like they they those people need to be able to compete against the higher skilled people or they'll just get so discouraged and stop playing and stop spending money. Yeah. So it definitely needs to be strong, especially after they've, they've shown, or especially after the past couple of years and how strong it's been, they can't go back or else people will just lose their minds when they realize they weren't <laughs> as good as they were or yeah. they thought they were. Uh, my biggest quarrel with it right now is just the visibility. There's so many garbage mechanics that are just like frustrating to deal with as a mouse and keyboard player. Like I, I even say it when playing mouse and keyboard, I have no clue how the people who play on mouse and keyboard see what they're shooting at. If they're not running sniper shotgun, that's all that I can run yeah. on mouse and keyboard. It's just, you basically, it requires, I've said a decade of experience to uh, basically what you're watching metaphor and Breadman and Huskers do is you rely on muscle memory of years and years and years of shooting at things and kind of guessing which way they're going to move without actually even being able to see them they're mm -hmm. guessing where those players are they're not they can't see them like there's so much smoke and flash and <laughs> yeah you know changes of color on the screen that they are literally guessing where the player is based off of you know engagements that they're in consistently or in the gulag you can't see anything in the no. gulag if you against if you go against a noir and you have an stg iron sight and you are on mouse and keyboard and you somehow win dude <laughs> that, that <laughs> deserves a round of applause yeah holy cow so just those things are very frustrating to me i would i would hope that in future games i think that we're kind of stuck with them on this modern warfare 2 engine yeah but as soon as they can, allow us to see what we're shooting at. I don't even care if aim assist is broken like it is going forward into the next 10 CODs. As long as I can see what I'm shooting at, that's fine. And I was going to say, you know, there needs to be aim assist, obviously, because obviously keyboard mouse has advantages at distance and things like that. You know, I wonder if people complain about aim assist so much because there's a lot more close engagements in Warzone than uh, potentially super long engagements. But all that aside it would probably felt a lot more balanced in Warzone 1 because of the things you just said. Would you agree with that? 100%. Like, yeah. I rarely, the only time I complained about aim assist out during one type of engagement in Warzone 1, other than that, you'd never heard me complain about it. It was through a stun. If you remember stunning a controller player, it, it, it gave them, them aimbot. At all? <laughs> it gave them aimbot. They became better at aiming after yeah. they got stunned. It was insane. So you couldn't run across their, uh, their reticle or else you're dead. And they got a reward mm -hmm. for it. Shake it off. Yeah. <laughs> i'd be remiss if i didn't at least bring up bobby the friendly stream sniper mm -hmm. he was a, a big part of when i was first coming into your streams anything you want to say about bobby the uh, friendly stream sniper and his pink anime uh brig bertha bobby's the best dude nobody's <laughs> been able to uh to come close to bobby since then we got some some pretty solid ones every once in a while squirt's pretty good um but the OG Bobby Harrison, dude, Let's rolling go, up in the uh, the pink Bertha. The you already just knew it was my first ever stream sniper, so I'll just I'll never forget that. I thought that was so cool growing up watching uh, Shroud with Wadu. Heck, yeah, <laughs> you know, just, just thinking that was so cool. I never thought it would happen to me. And then um, here comes Bobby rolling up in the Bertha, and I was like, <laughs> wait a second. It was just a very very cool feeling. So yeah, shout out to Bobby Harrison, dude. He's he's the goat. Hell yeah, shout out Bobby. All right, we also like to do a lightning round on these interviews. Um, so just first thing that comes to mind, just quick answers, uh, and uh, I'll run you through it if you're ready. I'll do my best. All right, favorite movie? Lone Survivor. Favorite band? I don't really listen to a lot of music. Um, does it have to be like a rock band? It can be anyone you want. It can be anybody that I want. Could, could it be an artist, too? I know this isn't sure, exactly yeah. rapid anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, you're good. <laughs> Um, let's go Eminem. All right. Favorite video game? PUBG. Uh, best superhero power? Uh, teleportation. If anybody says anything different, they're, they're tripping. That's hands down <laughs> the best one. Uh, favorite holiday? Um, 
It's either 4th of July or Thanksgiving. The 4th is my mom's birthday, so we'll go with the 4th. All right, there we go. Uh, favorite Call of Duty? Uh, 2019. It's just, there's a lot of good ones, but... Favorite meta? Warzone meta, I should say. Swiss Cold War MP... No, no, no. Swiss XM5. Or like XM4 it. was it? I think it was the XM4, the M4 type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, XM4, AR, yeah. yeah. That thing was that was nasty. so much fun. And it had a Swiss sick XM4. Fourth of July blueprint that one year, where it was just like shout out, like stars, stripes. It was awesome. <laughs> um, if you can only pick one for the rest of your life, are you choosing Call of Duty or are you choosing Destiny? Oh, Call of Duty for sure. Destiny's dead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Call of Duty for sure. And then just a pure yes or no: Will Black Ops Six Warzone be good? Simple yes or no. Okay. Um, yes. All right. That's the lightning round. Thank you very much for doing the lightning round, Iron. I appreciate it. Uh, appreciate and we'll talk you. a little bit more about uh, Black Ops Six as well. Let you get some get some info in on that. Um, but looking forward, you know, what's next for Iron? We talked about the fitness thing, but I know you're also getting more into consistently streaming Warzone again. Probably getting ready for Black Ops Six. Um, you know, what's your future in streaming that you, how you see it? Uh, I would like to continue to kind of grind away the, uh, the streams. I've just been having fun hanging out with people. I've basically turned into a just chatting stream 75% of the time and then just wake me up when it's winning time. It's kind of what <laughs> it's turned into is load up at the beginning, chill, get called the camper by, you know, three 15 year olds and then, uh, kill eight of the last 10 players and win. <laughs> Is, is usually how it goes down 50% of the time. And are you um, seeing your numbers grow back up again um, as you've been more consistent in streaming? Yeah, for sure. Trying to figure out, too, uh, a lot of the times with my schedule, I'm trying to figure out what is the best time for me to stream to be able to see Emma as much as I possibly can. Yeah. And she just started going to, uh, like, a daycare. Um, so now it's pretty clear, you know, like I have, like, a time. <laughs> exactly. It makes it a lot more consistent. Um, but, yeah, Definitely, I would hope that there's some competition for COD in the future because I love BRs, unless there's some sort of extraction shooter that really, really catches my attention, but I don't think so. I'm just not really into extraction. Yeah. So if Battlefield comes out with a BR or Black Ops 6, Call of Duty, Warzone kills it, um, you know, just continuing to grind instead of the uh, seven, eight hour streams, maybe we'll put in nine tens, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, definitely adding in a lot more fitness type stuff um going forward is kind of would be my branch away from cod yeah doing uh, i did i've done fitness streams in the past where i just stream my workouts i'll definitely do more of those in the future um i plan on doing some sort of coaching i have not <clears throat> figured out exactly how i want to do it yet but i have goals and like a vision for what i want it to eventually be so getting there i still need to figure out those steps but definitely uh definitely add that into it's just it's what i'm passionate about you know yeah it used to be the verdance um you know, grinding away for all those hours and now i've just kind of gotten back into uh the health and fitness which to be fair was my passion more of a time in my life than video games have been for sure i've been obsessed with training since i was little so still being consistent with streams but adding in more fitness stuff, whether it be streaming uh, my workouts or Instagram posts or actual coaching through a website or one on one stuff like that. Do you think you'll ever try for uh, to be number one for wins again? Uh, no, the time required is I would not be a present dad. <laughs> Basically, if you if you're serious about it, you know, mm -hmm. you can't really can't really see your or I couldn't really see Emma near as much as I want if I'm putting 80 hours in and if you're going to go against uh my past self there's zero chance that I would <laughs> zero chance so no I, I just have other things that I'm focused on right now I'll still try to win a high percentage of my games and if Black Ops 6 is as good as it's been since for dance I think realistically top 10 is more than doable maybe mm -hmm. even top five but uh number one it's just the time required to put in is just not realistic for the priorities in my life right now. And you mentioned Black Ops Six. Do you, from what you've seen, do you think that integration will be will be good? Uh, this is when you asked me, and I was just like, "Oh, short answer, yes or no." <laughs> I believe with the Warzone Two engine, we're capped at like a B minus C plus. I don't think that it's really possible for the game to get much better than that, just simply because of mechanics that are in the game that were added in with Warzone Two. 
uh, visibility being one for mouse and keyboard. And I'm, I'm speaking more for mouse and keyboard than I am for controller. I think the game is a better game on controller, which I was having a lot of fun with it on controller for a little bit. I just kind of got bored of actually playing on the controller. Yeah. But this, the, uh, the movement mechanics, the sway in your reticle, all of that kind of stuff, uh, I think it's capped out. I could be wrong. And the Omni movement could drastically change that. I am very excited for the Omni movement for the vast majority of gunfights. I think that people are underestimating how big of a skill gap that's going to be and how little you will die to bad players with Omni movement, especially if you're given enough space. Like I tried to give a few examples in the multiplayer when I was playing it. Um, just the normally, let's say if I'm aiming down doesn't have to be a hallway, but we'll say it's a lane. And there's somebody 20 meters away on a, uh, on a head glitch or they're like full committing around the corner about to, uh, to leave that head glitch. And you just like strafe out, you both shoot at each other. Uh, you, he cracks you, you only get a few shots into him. In the current version of Warzone, you have to 180, book it the other way. You can't sprint or else you don't put your plates in. You know, you, there's, it's like finicky with stuff. Right. Um, in this, you'll be able to just simply press back and you, you sprint backwards. You can like get a completely different angle 15 meters away that they're not ready for. It's going to take a lot for people to get ready for the reach out angles with the crazy, crazy strafe speed that unless you're a, a good player or really thinking outside of the box, um, that you're going to be able to just deal with below average players so much easier than currently. Because now, once again, like I was saying, if if he breaks you, you're pretty much stuck. Mm -hmm. You can't really you can't really do much unless you have like a very clear out. Um, but now you can just reach out 15 meters backwards, full health, and they're just like, wait, what? <laughs> so it, it'll be uh, it'll be fun when Omni Movement is introduced. I think that that will be a fresh uh, injection into the game as far as like a skill gap goes. Yeah, and I think that's why some of the pro players who got to play the early version were so worried that they would change the movement from what they used because they were like, oh, this is really good, um, mm -hmm. but maybe it'll create too big of a skill gap and they'll they'll chicken out and they'll, they'll back it off. But I, I believe that they tweeted out that they weren't going to change the movement, so that could be a good sign, but I guess we'll see. Um what else? I mean, you mentioned a lot of them, so maybe there's not much else. But, you know, what can Activision do to make sure they don't fall into some of the pitfalls that they did with Warzone 2 with Black Ops 6? I mean, we know that the movement's not going to be Warzone 2 or knock on wood shouldn't be Warzone 2. But is there anything else that you're super concerned about that could really ruin the game? Mm, man, we could have a whole conversation about Activision. I'm not their <laughs> biggest fan. Um Never have been, probably never will be. I like going back to Warzone One. I always used to say, if priorities one through ten weren't make as much money as they could, the game could be so much better. It's just that's it's very clearly all they care about is making money. Then they're good at it. You know, the the <laughs> store is awesome, but uh, there's just like a few things. Like uh, the biggest issue that's going on right now is they're shrinking the playlist down to solos and quads. And it was so easy to see that this was going to happen because they just neglected big map. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like you can't you can't think that this is a good idea to to just neglect something for a year and then be like, oh, not a lot of people are playing it. And then to not understand why not a lot of people are playing it. So uh, the biggest thing or the best thing that they could do that I think needs to happen. And I've been saying this for a while is they need to make a battle royale feel like a battle royale it's one of the reasons why i haven't been able to take it as seriously as i used to and there's nothing like winning a game of PUBG. not a single warzone win has ever even come close minus tourney ones mm -hmm. um to winning a singular game of PUBG because you have one life one mistake and it's over in in uh the current iteration of warzone in quads, you have nearly unlimited lives. It's multiplayer, you know? Yeah. So they they basically neglected Big Map for a year, and they all of their uh, seasonal or special events are all in Rebirth. So then they they just see all of the numbers pumped into Rebirth, and they're just like, oh, people want to play Rebirth. Let's just continue doing stuff with that, and why are people not playing Big Map? Not sure, let's just not do anything with it. It's just... <laughs> And I'll tell you why people aren't playing Big Map. You know, it's, it doesn't. Big Map feels like Big Map Resurgence. It's not even a battle royale anymore. It hasn't been one for well over a year. Make it a BR. The a simple, 
I've given this fix back in the Verdance days. How you make your life matter in a big map is for every death, double the cost of revive. It's simple. It, that would make it so you can't just have one person landing back in trying to get their stuff. Shaded would be about 20 grand by the time we got <laughs> done with the game. Poor Shaded. That's, that's, his, that's his, the, uh, the most consistent thing Shaded does is lands back on his loot with, with a full team on top of it. <laughs> You guys are supposed to protect me there. Oh, yeah, that would uh, that would go a long, long way. Get rid of all the redeploy, this and that. And um, in ranked, if they are serious, again, another huge skill gap is friendly fire. Those two things would drastically change how the game played, and it would be so enjoyable. I understand that you can't do friendly fire in pubs. That would be awful. <laughs> yeah. That would be terrible. <laughs> I could just see my little brother now. He would just log in to kill people and log off. Like That's just who he is. So, but in uh, in ranked, it would add a whole new dynamic to the team fights, which that was one of my favorite things in PUBG is like when you're uh, trying to clear a house or take a, a second story of something, mm -hmm. it has to be extremely coordinated. You can't just have one person at the bottom just chucking frags while the other two sprint up the stairs and bust through the door at the same time. Like you have to uh, time everything, calm everything, the uh, <clears throat> like... Yeah, it'll just be so much more enjoyable. So much more. Well, Iron, I think we've said it all. I really appreciate your time today. I think walking through your journey and some of the battles you've been through will be inspiring for people to hear. Um, I want to thank you personally for a lot of the entertainment that you provided us over the years. I mean, I've been a big fan for a long time, obviously. Uh, I have no doubt your future is going to be bright. Like we've talked about before, you're kind of one of those guys who you put your mind to something and you're not going to stop until you hit it. So I have no doubt that the future for Iron um, back healthy is going to be insane. I'm, I'm excited to watch it. So Iron's back better than ever. And again, thank you for your time today, Iron. I appreciate it. Grateful for you, man. All right. Grateful for you. Thank you. Talk to you soon, Iron.